Hello. Hey there. Ah. I see important people are joining. Yeah. I'm wondering how this will go. Gosh, exactly right. At this dinner, yeah. I told my students this morning something will happen or it won't. Yeah. Conversation marker. Yep. Do you want me to uh, do any timing? You know, maybe if somebody starts talking and talking and talking and doesn't stop, you know? Just I, I mean, do you have a do you have a general sense of how to carve up the time? Yeah, I was thinking we'd probably need a few minutes to start. Um then intro will take a few minutes just so everyone knows who's who. And yeah, then. No, I think from then on we should kind of we should leave at least 15 minutes at the end for questions. I was what's thinking. Our, what's our total time? An hour. One hour. Okay. All right. So I can certainly signal when that time happens. And if it seems like we're spending a lot of time on one question and we might want to get to another one, I might say, should we consider yep. moving to another question? Yep, exactly. Okay. And so, I mean, I have the, <laughs> the slides, the so-called, <laughs> the content-free slides. I have them here. And I also have some with a bit more content if we don't actually get into a proper conversation. So I have a backup plan if everything that's, goes that's completely kabooey. That, that sounds good. And Polly is in Mexico and... <sighs> I'm envious. But it looks like people are coming. Mm -hmm. Good morning from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Oh, wow. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Or well, afternoon here. Happy solstice. I'm not solstice, well, equinox. It's equinox. equinox in about an hour. Yeah, it's supposedly spring. I'm looking disgruntledly out of the window. All right, we're definitely getting a few people. How cool. And Joe just told me that the Eventbrite thing was being weird, so we probably shouldn't expect to start entirely on time. Was it weird for you, Suri? I, I had to do three tries to get in. I had to enter with just the numerical uh, ID for the meeting. Nothing else worked.
weird. Yeah, it worked surprisingly smoothly for me, but even my computer knew who I was, which is very unusual. That's even suspect. That's... <laughs> and I think I'm the only host, so I think in a minute they will cut the cable here and everything will be gone. Do you want to make Joe a co-host? I can't. Okay. Oh, hey, Polly. Polly is there. Oh, good. And the yeah, only I person am. I could make a co-host is somebody here in at the USASC. This is why you and Polly aren't co-hosts. Ah, okay. Well, we'll just see what happens. Yep. Let me see. I can see if I can make her a co-host. Um, what is say? Siri. Okay. Oh, she can't be a co-host. Nope. No, we're not in the right uh, institution. You're not in the no. right institution. Okay. Uh, we'll just hope for the best. Okay. So people are still joining. So I think we'll wait another minute or so before we start How much longer should we wait? I think we're stabilizing in the high 20s now. Then we shouldn't make them wait too much longer. Go, says Hishin Lai. So that's, that's what we were waiting for. Ah, who wants to start? You have to. I have to. Welcome, everyone. Um, to our first linguistics luncheon of 2023. This is something that the linguistics department at the University of Saskatchewan is trying to make into a regular event, which means that we manage at the moment to do something, I think on average once every nine months. So we're, we're working on it. Um, I'm Olga Lavik. And I'm a professor here at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'm wondering about the best order. I will start with acknowledging where I am. So I'm in Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. This is not where I am from. You can hear my accent. I'm from Germany originally. And today we're going to spend time mentally at least, and some of us physically in Alaska. And so I'm joined by two friends, Polly Heislip and Siri Tuttle. So maybe first Polly can introduce herself and then Siri. Hi everybody, I'm Polly Heislip. I'm from Northway. I was born and raised there. And I work now as a research professor at the Alaska Pacific University. I'm a language worker. And, uh, and so I've been, uh, I left home for 30 years. I came back in 1995 and I started my language 
a work with Dr. with Paul Milanowski, and he um, he taught us a lot of um, how to write and grammar. And um, but there's a lot more to learn, and I'm glad to be here. Oh, and I'm beaming in from Mexico. <laughs> Sorry, I'm apologizing too. <laughs> we like your background, Polly. Uh, I'm I'm Siri Tuttle. I uh, am from Seattle, which uh, weirdly enough is where I am right now. Um, and in the Lushootsi country, uh, where they are starting to put up signs with the right languages on them. It is it really exciting. I took a picture of one yesterday. I'm so excited. I'm down on the Duwamish Waterway. Um, I am a linguist like Olga, and I'm a language worker like Polly, too. And I've worked with both of them for many years. And I have not worked as closely with the, the language in Northway as either of them, although I've been around when they were doing it. And I'm here to um, help them uh, just run this little uh, soiree and just step in if we need to move a little bit forward or if uh, if anything happens that uh, needs to be announced, like if somebody puts an, an, an interesting question in the chat and they don't notice, that kind of thing. So that's my role. And I will be stepping back to my knitting and letting Olga get going. Okay, and so to warn everyone, especially everyone who was hoping for, you know, words of wisdom, we don't have a great deal of wisdom to offer. Instead, what we thought we would do would really be to think about grammar writing, language revitalization, both from the linguist perspective, so from my perspective, and from the community perspective, which is represented here by Polly, but also by some other audience members I see. So this is great. Um, and so we thought what we'd start with, and I just need to dig that up, is a little bit on the background of our paternity, because I, I see that a bunch of you are from there, but there's also people who don't know a lot about it. And so we thought we would start there. And so what we want to talk about is really why write a grammar, and I'll show this is, our slides are really pitiful. Um, this is what we have. So these are the questions we want to get to. What does a community need in order to do language revitalization? How does writing the language support that? How does studying grammar support that? What publications by linguists are useful and treasured by communities for community language work? How can we learn to create useful publications? Because frequently what we produce is not particularly useful. And how can we keep useful publications around after the initial release? So those are some of the questions that we hope to get to. And so just to situate ourselves, this is the map of Alaska languages and very simply Dene languages are in reddish shape shades and Inupiaq, Yupik, etc. are blue. So we are talking about Upper Tanana, I like to call it the little strawberry. And as you can see, it is on the border between the US and Canada. And this actually is already a challenge because it means that many things have to take two different government systems into account, and that really doesn't make anything easier. My work has been primarily in Alaska, and I'm beginning to learn a little about the Canadian varieties. And for those of you who've never seen it, this is what it looks like. On the left, there is an old picture of Las Tetlin, which is the fishing place of the Tetlin people in particular. So you see the fish weir in the foreground and you see some cabins in the background. And on the right, you see an aerial view of that area, same place. And it really, it, it looks exactly like this still, just in color. <laughs> T 
here we have a satellite image of the area. And you can see this is really where the Tanana River begins. This is the place where the Nebesna and the Shoshana join. And then we have the Tanana going off to the northwest here. The picture is actually tilted a bit wrong. And so the main we can see here actually here is the Northway airstrip, which is a very important piece. And Northway Village. I'd need to zoom in a little. Is there? I promise it's there. And this is the area where people used to spend time. So it's it's lakes, boreal forest. But the other really important thing you can see here is this line just north of the river, and that is the Alaska Highway. And that is the point where things in the Upper Tanana area really began to change. And maybe this is where I should let Polly take over for a bit, because this is really where the transition from the transi traditional lifestyle to the white man's way began. Oh, okay, thank you, Olga. Uh, in 1942, the Alaska Highway was built um, during the war. And so that was the first real important change, um, big change in the Upper Tanana region. We had been uh, contacted earlier um, through, there's been some gold found there, but there was really, the Alaska Native Upper Tanana people, uh, their lives were pretty unchanged until the war, until the road came through. And my mother was 12 years old uh, when that happened. Her first language was Upper Tanana, Diné, Scotty Creek dialect. And I want to recognize Bruce Irvin from Northway, who speaks a Northway dialect, Teresa Vandermeer, who speaks a Scotty Creek dialect, and Travis David, who spe speaks a Tetland dialect, all Upper Tanana workers and speakers here in um, here right now. And so, um, so my mother was 12 years old. Her first language was Upper Tanana Scotty Creek dialect. We are immigrants to Alaska because we came from the Canada side. And so, um, and so my first language was English. And so that's how quickly our languages changed um, since, um, since, the, since the road came through because with the road came the, um, well, there was, there was a school already established across the river for in the new, the, the old village across the river. So my mother started school there. And so she learned to read and write, but she was never very proficient in, well, she was good, she was okay. She did okay reading and writing. And a lot of the speakers, the um, fluent speakers, they taught themselves English and how to speak and read and write English. So that was basically the biggest change we had was the road. And the airport, of course. So Northway at the same time got this you can see this very, very large airstrip, which is because Northway was the first community when you fly up from the continental US, you fly over Canada. And this is the first community past the border. So this was the first place in America where planes could stop to refuel. So Northway had this very, very big and important airstrip. Um, which then also led to a large military presence for quite a few years. I never know when that really ended, but lots of the people that I've talked to have spoken about this. And so, yeah, the change came really suddenly. So it's not in, frequently in North America, you have this gradual thing, but here it was like, right, we're building a road, we're building an airport, now you're assimilating, go. So a very unusual situation. I just really wanted to stress that. And then just last week was the anniversary, the 81st, I think, anniversary of the Alaska Highway construction. And it's always being talked about as this great heroic feat. And it's like, yeah, on the one hand, building a road. These are just some people putting out the midline, I think. Yes, it was an amazing feat of engineering, but it also had some consequences that are 
a lot more problematic. So I feel this should be acknowledged here as well. So I think, and we're coming now very much to the end of the slides. There are a few of the speakers that I've worked with that I wanted to acknowledge. And these aren't all the people that I've worked with. These are the people that I've worked with and could find a photo of, which I'm terrible at taking photos of people I've learned. And so we have here Roy David from Tetlin and a very old picture of Roy Sam. I just like the danger explosive in the background. And Avis Sam. Those are three wonderful elders that I've been privileged to work with and all three continue to do well. And then I also want to acknowledge four elders that are no longer with us that also I have worked with a lot. So Darlene Northway from Northway, Cora David from Tetlin, Rosalie Brewer from Northway and Sherry Demet Barnes from Northway. So they were absolutely wonderful ladies and they're very much missed by all of us. And so I think now we are ready to launch into our main questions, which is thinking about what does a community actually need and how can linguists support this? This is really the main thing we're looking at. And just to give you an idea of how the timing will go, we are hoping to have about 15 minutes at the end for questions, but we might expand that or yeah, we'll just see how it goes. And I think I'll hand it back over to Polly now. Okay, um, so um, the first question, what does community need in order to do language revitalization work? Uh, I think that um, th there's real important uh, need for uh, linguists um, when uh, working with the community um, because uh, we do we are working in our language <laughs> work already what we're what we're we're not versed in is the grammar and so we kind of stumble along and some are better than others but um, but we're always like um, it, te texting all got well I am like is this uh, is this like how it's supposed to be spelled and so we would really benefit. And Paul Milanowski helped us a lot. He was not, he was a um, missionary linguist. And so he, he transcribed um, certain books of the Bible. And so he tried to teach us something that was like way, it was really too advanced for us, but you know, he tried his best. And I did learn some real basics in the, in the sounds of our grammar. But I, what we, I do believe is that if linguists could um, offer us how to spell and write and our grammar, because we're always asking each other how to do, how to spell this, and we do the best we can. But um, I don't know if you want to, if you want to hear from the other three uh, language workers from the Upper Tanana as well, what their needs yes. are. Yes. That could be a really fun thing. I wanted to say one thing about the spelling very briefly, and that is. It's the, the main reason for spelling is that we need to find words, you know, find them in the dictionary, recognize the word when we encounter it again. So I think it is actually also important to not get too hung up on spelling. It's yes, it is a tool, but it's, you know, it's, we're not English teachers in elementary school. It's not the main, it's not the be all and end all. It's not the goal, it's a tool. But yeah, I would love to hear from the others. And so, we'd also like to hear from you guys. Like what, what is your contribution to our community with, with uh, as linguists? But yeah, the other three, I'd sure like to hear from Bruce and then Teresa and then Travis. Bruce, you first. John Irvin Mosi. Uh, hello everybody. My name is uh, Bruce Irvin. I come from uh, Northway and I live here in Toke and acknowledge the Upper Ten and Dene lands here at the Tokentier Alaska campus. 
And my mother's name is uh, Betty Didrickson, and my father's name is uh, John Irvin. And I'm actually I just started with UAF last November as a, a term assistant professor of language and culture. So half my times with the upper Canada language and half my times with uh, other traditional art classes. And <clears throat> we had a, a, our first two classes, uh, not last week, but the week before. And uh, I think they went pretty well. We're having fun just starting off real basic with, uh, you know, it's a real basic introduction to literacy. And so I've been, uh, you know, looking through the Alaska Native Language Archive. Uh, I've been going through Paul Milanowski's uh, Northway Dictionary, Tetland Dictionary. And I've also been studying a lot of uh, Avis Sam's lesson plans. And also I've been looking through, um, you know, women tell stories about Northway. Um, that was really, really helpful with, uh, you know, do, doing some of the grammar work with, um, with the Northway dialect. And so with, with this class, I'm, I'm trying to offer it with a Northway dialect and also a Tetlin dialect because one of my students is uh, Travis David and I don't want him to feel left out. So I'm, I'm trying to um, do them both at the same time. And um, so it's uh, in person and it's online through Zoom and just learning so much about, you know, how to be a, be a language teacher and, you know, utilizing our, our, our new technology for language. And so I'm, I'm just real happy to be here today with this. And I, you know, personally, I, I do agree that, um, you know, it, it would be really important to have this grammar and have to, and have our, you know, linguists help out with it. Um, I think between both the Northway and Tetlin dictionaries, um, there's a lot of similarities, but um, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out which words are different um, just because of the two different dialects and, you know, the correct ways to write them and how to speak them. And I'm, I'm also a language learner myself. So I think, you know, just what I found in the, the women tell stories about Northway that with all good and you know everybody put together in that book was really helpful in the beginning and it's really helping me a lot too with the class and um so i do agree and i don't want to take up too much time on letting other people talk too so that's a need. thank you thank you and i'm so pleased to meet you at least in this way it's i hope to meet you at some point in person but it's it's better than nothing right but wonderful to meet you. And I'm so happy you're doing this. And I'm so happy that UAF is seeing the light there and putting more work towards the language. That is absolutely wonderful. And I was going to say to you really quick, I forgot to mention that I got accepted into the, the Doyon Languages Online teacher cohort. So I'll be uh, I'll be working with the Upper Ten in a language, uh, creating new software and, um, you know, going through the, the upper Canada lessons and uh, you know I've been reaching out already to the community telling people to you know check it out if there's anything that needs edits uh, I'll be working with the team at Doyon Foundation to um, add updates and create new work and it's it's pretty cool I like it so far great thank you so much there's Teresa Vande Vandermeer did you want to share Teresa Travis, and then there's another person from Northway. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. My uh, headphones weren't working yesterday, so I wasn't sure if I could talk, but hi, nice to see you, Olga, and other Olga, <laughs> and Polly. Um, yeah, super happy to be here. I just really wanted to pop in and listen. Um, for those that don't know me, um, I'm from Tsokakai, Anik, so Scotty Creek and Beaver Creek. Yukon, so I'm on the Canadian side of things. Um, so yeah, really, um, yeah, very much a language learner. <laughs> and grammar is tricky. I had difficulty with like just English grammar um, in school. So 
you know, trying to learn um, my Indigenous language and grammar on top of that has been quite difficult. Um, but it's it's kind of like your head has to change into like seeing the system of how the language works because it's very like I don't know it's just kind of laid out in that way um but yeah it's been uh it's been tricky but we're we're moving along and you know just like Bruce you said like Tetlin dictionary Northway dialect uh Scotty Creek dialect like we all have kind of dictionaries and things like that that I kind of use to uh, start picking and choosing to to see which ones kind of match close to Scotty Creek. Um, but it is still quite complicated. You know, our language is really, really old. Um, and some of our words are no longer with us. Um, you know, elders have passed on and things like that, or we're rediscovering words, which I think is really fascinating. Um, but yeah, just happy to be here. Sini Cho, uh, I don't know what else to add. That's it. <laughs> Thank Lovely you. to see you again. So Travis is, um, if you're there, Travis, Travis actually is works for the Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge. He's done some really important work with, with the language there. Travis? Hello. Oh, can you hear me? All right. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just, um, just kind of going through, trying to listen to the conversation and trying to figure out, you know, I like, I like what Olga said earlier about what was one of the most beloved materials or the things that you use. And, um, there's a lot of really good ones. Um, I can't really put my finger on it, but I think Olga, when you did the book with Cord. David and there was two pages in that book in the very beginning that kind of had um, descriptions of how you should move and put your tongue inside of your mouth and how the air comes in and out. Um, I think that really helped me out a lot and it broke through a little barrier I was having, especially when I would sit by myself and start trying to read and then interpret what I was reading and to what I was saying. Because once I got through that portion of how the pronunciation was supposed to go, I could actually read it out of the book to a fluent speaker and then they can interpret exactly what I was trying to say. And that kind of broke, uh, broke a barrier I was having, um, especially with words that were forgotten. Um, or they didn't remember what the word was. And I think that's on my little journey through language, I think that's something that I actually, I, I like that. I like that that actually happened. Um, and that's something that, I, that I've been trying to work on lately. And I'm just a language learner and that's probably gonna be that way for a long time, but um, yeah, I'm just glad to sit here and listen to you all. And and thank you for me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm I'm glad that pronunciation key is helpful. I believe I actually stole that from Siri Tuttle. We should we should always acknowledge who we steal things from. And that one is heavily inspired by one that Siri put together, I think for the Minto dictionary, it may have been. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so, you know. And and I borrowed from some of the first language books I ever studied, like Teach Yourself Welsh. So, you know, we, we learn from everything we study. Learn from, not steal from, right. Um, <laughs> important distinction, I guess. There's there's another speaker from Northway, a language worker, Tanisha, Tanisha Moses. She's a language learner as well. Do, would you like to share? And Tanisha is uh, her her auntie grandma was uh, Rosa Brewer. Is Rosa Brewer? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Tanisha Moses, and 
like Polly said, my grandma's Rosa Brewer. So I, I think Olga, I think I grew up with you in our, <laughs> in our, in the back bedroom with my grandma, with the, where her sewing table was, um, interviewing her with your computer. So I have like young memories of you being in our home. Um, so just really happy to be a part of this conversation. And um, my grandma has passed on now. And um, I felt like I had kind of like lost an opportunity to learn my language because I don't have that direct connection. But um, I just was looking at a copy of your newest book and I was emotional because I feel like it's an opportunity for me to kind of continue that. Um, Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. I don't know. I think we've heard most of this. I think it was just at the beginning that we couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, well, Polly said most of it. I'm Tanisha Moses. My grandma is Rosa Brewer, and I'm just happy to be able um, to be part of this conversation. Oh, Polly can't hear me. Oh, how weird. Mm -hmm. I totally. I can Polly, you. can you hear me? Maybe Polly has lost. I'll message her. Anyways, thank you. Um, I'm also a language learner and I'm also teaching my young kids. So um, this is really important to me and I just feel so grateful. Hope you got it Thank you. Out. Yeah. Thank you for being here. And yes, I remember that we met. You've changed a little, but it's a long time since I've been there. Yeah, so Polly, can you hear us again? No, okay. Shoot. Um, so Siri has been taking notes on what is helpful, which is really, thank you, Siri. <laughs> so she was saying dictionary, storybooks with pronunciation keys, grammar in the Avis lessons. Um, and yeah, and then people have been talking about how the grammar of a language Maybe let me uh, send, or can someone send Polly a message trying to disconnect and rejoin? Sometimes that helps. I'll do it. Thank you. Because one of the problems is that grammar can be really a stumbling stone, just like spelling can be a stumbling stone. And I always feel it shouldn't, it shouldn't be because. I mean, I love grammar. This is why I became a linguist. But the way I like to think about it is really, it's just the rules that tells you how to put a sentence together. So that you know how, how to organize your words so, they're, so you can make yourself understood. And I sometimes find that grammar especially especially in English class you know when you go to elementary school and your teacher tells you off no this is poor grammar and you need to write better that is something else so that is not what we are trying to do and instead what we are trying to do is to come up with better ways of just explaining how the structure works um So last year I was teaching through the YNLC, I was teaching a class in Upper Tanana Grammar and Teresa was one of my students and Polly as well. And that is where we kind of, where we looked at some of these things and just looked at how can we, how can we explain stuff and also how can we make some of the information that is, for example, in the dictionaries more useful to people. Um, so maybe one of the things I'll quickly, while I wait for Polly to come back, talk about is 
the one of the big issues with grammar writing, and this is something that was definitely the problem in the grammar that I just wrote, is that they're not necessarily, no, not, not necessarily, they're written in linguistic terminology. And that really is a big stumbling block because if you come there from the learner's perspective, you don't know the linguistic terminology and you're trying to learn the language. And then the terminology is kind of like an in-between layer of additional difficulty, right? And that is really, that makes it very, very hard. And when I originally set out to work on grammar, I really tried to avoid this. What I had wanted to do was to write something that would be immediately useful for learners, that it would be immediately intelligible. And I totally couldn't do it. This was something that really took me, I think, five years of trying to do it and not getting anywhere with it. The challenge is really is if you want to explain something, you need to understand it first, right? But to understand it, because I'm a linguist, and that is what I know how to do, to understand it, I needed to put it into words that make sense to me, linguistic terminology. But the result of that was then something that isn't of use or of immediate use to the people who would want to use it so in a way, the next thing that would need to happen from my perspective is actually for me to, and with the help of the learners and the teachers, is to find a way of translating that stuff into something that is useful for learners and teachers. So that would be something that I would now really want to start doing because now I feel that I have a bit of a handle on the grammar, but now we need to find a way of making that accessible for everyone else. Um, is Polly back? I yeah, I'm teaching Polly and the messenger says, oh, there she is. Yes, I'm she back. wasn't in the meeting. Now she was. Yay! <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. I lost audio. I'm sorry. I lost it. Um, yeah, I I did, came back. So I don't know how much of what I was saying you just heard. I I heard it. I heard what you said. Um, and what do you you want me to respond or <laughs> do you want? <laughs> yep, that would be really good. I, I don't know where we want to take it now. Um, well, I, I think that where I want to take it is that I would, and I, you do have, you, linguists and you, you play an important role in the revitalization of our, of our grammar, of our language. And the reason I say this is because um, we, we 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 know the we know the um our we know we have speakers still not many but we have speakers uh fluent speakers in our community that will that have helped us but they're no longer of t they're very elderly and so so and so we do want to go forward and get it, get the language taught in our schools so right now the importance is teaching teaching language to teachers who will be the ones teaching. For example, I'm creating a I'm creating language lessons with absolute, it's like I, I feel handicapped because I'm creating language lessons and, I, and I'm actually taking a class from, um, uh, from U UAS, University of Alaska Southeast, um, from another, a Tlingit um, who is teaching us how to create language lessons for the classroom. And so it's like, we're despite the fact that we're learning the best we can with whatever resources are available, 
it would be very useful for us if we had the language taught to us, our grammar. And, and it's possible because um, like Bruce says, well, I don't know if Bruce teaches um, language via Zoom. Do you, I think you do Bruce. Um, and I would, and but I've taught, I've taught um, language um, via Zoom and I get people who are language learners from all over the States who have left for whatever reason. And so there's interest there. But you know what we need to do is, is we need to start getting the language back into our classrooms, and we need to, we need to create teachers who can create. Uh, we should be creating teachers that can create language. And so the first thing is like learning the grammar and um, of our language because if we can agree on grammar, because what's happening now is the uh, the language workers. Some of them are using English to translate our language, and I can't read it. You know, because I'm looking at it, am I trying to guess? Because I've I've learned through Paul Milanowski some you know some of the grammar, the basic grammar. But if I can, if I read something that's that's translate our language translated using English, I can't read it. It's difficult for me to read. So what's happening is there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, attempts, but there's like if we don't have if if we're not working with the same grammar is a lot of confusion and um and it shouldn't be that there and so there you know it shouldn't be it shouldn't be the confusion we should be able to go forward with some with with grammar that we we agree on uh, and i'm talking about spelling and sounds and um so i think that's a, that's grammar and the rest yeah so that's basically and yeah and so we are going forward and we are still doing what we can and um, and teaching and learning and working. I'm, I'm more in document, documenting the language and learning, like finding out where can we archive our language so we can use it for for educational purposes in the upper Tanana. You know, that's can, where I'm kind of my focus is on and I'll always be a language learner, but still, I think it's um, creating a, and what we're doing at APU and UAA, and we've we've got the other other Alaska campuses, the Tokyo University UAS, is we're creating a language virtual language support group. Like we're working together to see who's doing what, where, and how can you know how can we share our resources and and support one another in our work. And we meet once a month on second Fridays, so. Yeah, second Friday. So that's that's what we're doing at the university level. But but our language is our life. It should actually not just remain in the in the classroom. It should actually be in our community. And so there's there's a lot of uh, opportunity for language to grow and to live other places outside the classroom. But it, the classroom is important. Grammar is important. Yeah. And I hear you, what you say about spelling. So I say spelling shouldn't be a stumbling block, but if one tries to spell Upper Tanana with English, then it does end up being a barrier in and of itself as well, because the sounds don't match up. So, yep, that's... But again, I, I also feel always that we should focus and from the linguist perspective is I really think we need to think harder about how could we actually make it easier? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I'll not go into that. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think for myself, looking up, if I've been in uh, jumping into the dictionary, just to look up you know, some of the words like phonology and, you know, some of those things, um, maybe explaining some of those uh, bigger, bigger words to language learners is something that I'm, I'm trying to work on to, like providing, you know, the, the, the definition of those bigger words, even like the upper, the Yukon Native Language Center has a really great alphabet that, you know, there's words on there like alveolar, um, you know, words I'd never even seen before myself. So like I, what I did is I went online and, you know, I found a, I think it was a phonology uh, picture 
the word, where those words are in the mouth, and that's something that we're going to cover cover this week. That uh, trying to give them an idea of where you know where your tongue is supposed to be. You know if it's going to be in the back, middle, the front. If it's going through your nasal, uh, your your glottal stops. It shows right where that is at. So I think kind of just breaking it down. You know, trying to. Um, I guess make it a lot more simpler, more easier to understand. It would be a good step going forward. And, uh, you know, I really like how Paul Milanowski, you know, he has like the alphabet letter. And then uh, what I did is I, I, I you know, I, I identified all the ones that are Northway and Tetlin. And then uh, I put an N by it or a T by it. And then I found words in the Northway dialect and words in the Tetlin dialect in the upper Tanana language. And then for myself growing up, you know, English is my first language, but upper Tanana is my second language that I'm learning now. And I guess it kind of helps me to see that other little box there that shows, um, you know, how to pronounce the letter with, uh, you know, a similar English word, you know, like, B, you want to say B, like how you say B when you say book. Um, just trying to get them familiar with that sound and how to pronounce it. And, you know, I even told one student to, uh, you know, close your mouth and just, mm, you know, push air through your nose. And but she, she was having a hard time with the nasal part. Like, I think that's something that she's just trying to get down to. And, um, just thinking of, you know, simple things like that to help them uh, pick up on, you know, pronunciation and uh, stuff like that. But I think another big thing too, you know, even though we do learn the language, um, you know, we, we got to really hit the elementary schools, get those young kids learning while they have that, you know, they're in that that mind frame where it's easier for, easier for them to pick up on the language and, you know, they could learn something real easy versus someone like myself who's in their 40s that it takes me a little bit longer and then even if we do get those kids learning and they're doing really well we have to still teach their parents too because when they go home they need a parent to talk to you know it's, it's like you're you're teaching two people at the same time and then connecting them with our elders to the the fluent speakers which is something I was going to talk to Polly and Travis and Olga. It would be really, really, uh, I'd like to get a list together of all our fluent speakers in Upper Ten and who are, who are still with us to um, maybe we can try and match them with new language learners so that, you know, like one of my other students who is on here, you know, he doesn't really have anybody to talk to to actually have a conversation with to hear the words. Um, those are just some of the things that I've been noticing in my short time um, teaching and I wanted to bring it up. Thank you. Those are those are really good ideas. So because yeah, like like simply an explanation of the terms, that is something we totally can put together what would be i i'm wondering though and this is just just to think this through would that be most helpful in the form of a website or in the form of a pdf i mean i'm just thinking about you know what how could we put this together so it would be most useful oh of the above <laughs> whatever you could offer I'm, I'm like yeah whatever whatever would really help i think uh for myself pdf is good word document um i don't think a lot of people have access to adobe or you might have to have a subscription to do edits in there i think word would be a lot easier um, yep good point good point yeah no, thank you. That is a brilliant suggestion. Or we could even start a Google Doc or something. Let me let me think about this a little bit, okay? 
I also yeah. think that th um, teaching, like having a, and the universities will support this, is like uh, offering a certificate in Upper Tanana language is something that the universities can actually work together and support. I know my university will support it. I don't know how it works, but it does work because I've worked with other universities in different languages. But, you know, when we, in order to get our language into the schools and create our own language camps, we, we need certificates. And so maybe start the conversation of, of creating a certificate, maybe even going up to, you know, to a minor and teaching. I, I'm not quite sure how to do this, but it really is something that we should start talking about. And because PDF is good and it's helpful, but if we can't hear it and we can't see it being pronounced, it's difficult. So, um, because we don't, you know, most of us here are, we're just, we don't even know, we don't know what, you know, how the language, when it's, we see it in PDF, we don't really quite know how to say it. Um, I can say a lot of it because I took classes with Paul, but, you know, um, I'm still not proficient. So, um, you know, but creating our own language lessons and, but we, I just want to say that, you know, maybe just starting the conversation in working with um, Olga's university and with with our universities on, um, you know, um, Tokyo University, UAF, and seeing if we can offer um, a certificate in Upper Tanana language. And I'll say something after Siri. I see Siri's got her hand up. Oh yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, I created a, a linguistic glossary for a book I did for the um, uh, upper Atna group uh, at their request. Uh, I, I wrote, a, this is a sort of a sketchy beginning of a grammar for them uh, that was intended as a uh, companion to the Atna dictionary. And they wanted it specifically a glossary of the terms I was using with links from the text. And I am still using this, even though I'm now teaching students who speak Navajo, I'm still using the same glossary idea in my classes because it, it really helps people to have a place to go that is specific for Dene languages. If you look on the internet generally, you may find just a, a wealth of information, but you might not find the particular definition that your author is using. So uh, I, I, I think putting it in the book with the other stuff is great and uh, also using it for multiple purposes. Yeah, and I was gonna mention that too, that would be I was talking with somebody else like a couple of weeks ago and it'd be really great to, you know, sit down with the fluent speaker and go through each word that's in the dictionary and have them pronounce it. And then, you know, somebody later on can go through and like, hey, how do you pronounce the word for mosquito or the word jittai for old man? Um, like that would be really helpful for someone like myself too. Yeah, and this is actually something because we have, uh, Tanisha has her hand up too, so we, we have lots of recordings, even of word lists, we have those, the problem is, the problem is somebody needs to find the time to go through and do that, and I know Polly is working on a recording at the moment doing that, going through and transcribing and chunking it up, right? You're doing that at the moment, but even for one recording, it takes an age. And yeah, it's always, this is always a problem, just not enough hours in the day. Tanisha, what did you want to add? I was going to suggest um, kind of what you're saying, but like, I think if we have um, speakers still, it'd be nice to see like videos of conversation that can be referenced. So instead of just having like, um, like specific words, but I think seeing like a person's like body language and like facial movements is helpful too. Cause I know when I took Bruce's class or he did a workshop for a festival of native arts, I noticed that when people were talking, I was really looking at their mouths, you know, really looking at like, you know, their facial expressions because it's some of those sounds like the glottal stops are kind of hard for me. And um, so I think having video of like short conversations that are like natural, like, I'm just imagining like my grandma and Ada, like they would be, I think they were probably gossiping, but just, you know, just like seeing them talk, like having that conversation. Um, I think that's 
important too, not just um, like being able to speak the words, but also be able to see like context. Yeah. And this is something that, you know, you guys there, you can, you can do this. This is really hard for me to do, unfortunately, because I'm so far away and haven't visited for so long due to, well, mainly COVID really. Um, but, and I know there's very few speakers there, but still, I think, I think you guys can do this and I know for the Doyon languages online thing, we were doing some of these things. And it was amazing to have these people in a room and having jokes and all of that. That was, yeah, that is so much fun. By the way, I hope everyone is looking at the chat because there's a lot of really helpful links and ideas. So do please, um, Please say something. Uh, look at that. And Kristen, Kristen Vopas says something about Miss Rachel. I have no idea what Miss Rachel is. Um, okay, Tanisha knows. She's laughing, but the old people look confused. Um, <laughs> what is Miss Rachel? It's for toddlers. It's like YouTube, and she teaches them how to like speak and I don't know but she'll like if she's like saying like ball she'll go ball and like she'll like really emphasize her <laughs> how she says it yeah thank you sorry yeah I, I haven't watched kids tv in years do we have any other comments or questions here our time is almost up I just wanted to um, answer the question really quickly um, to why like grammar is important. And Polly had brought up a point like where people will join in through Zoom, like all over, you know, Alaska, all over the country. And I think it's just, we're not in a community and we're not um, next to each other to be able to learn together. So I think having being able to write something down um, I know I have like an introduction written down because um, I just haven't memorized it and I haven't practiced it enough, but I'm able to write it down. That way I can practice it like when I introduce myself. Um, and that's really valuable to me because I'm not, you know, in a community. Yeah. And that is also where this having ask a friend thing would be really helpful, just this. Who can I call when I have a question? Yeah. And Hishin Lai raised her hand. Sorry, I'm just like not. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to this. And I think it's really great to have a grammar and it's really important. Um, and I know that um, I'm a language learner myself, which in. And um, I learned when I was like ah, really old. <laughs> and um, but one of the things that I found really helpful too was the um, knowledge of second language acquisition and how to uh, learn your language. So that has helped helped me a lot. But I also learned a lot from um, Jeff Lear. Some of you probably know him, and. Um, he was confusing, but I mean, I learned, I took really good notes. And uh, I think that he, um, he did me some, some really good work. And I think that, yes, um, having the grammar is, is a very good start. Um, and then series idea, phonology, and how to make it, it you know, say the sounds and stuff like that. I don't normally, I don't teach that in my class because the students just pick it up. And so I'm, I, sh I should also say that I, I've been teaching which in at the university for since 2002. And when I got there, I had nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and so, um, and I didn't even know how to 
teach a student how to make the sounds. I didn't know the grammar. And so just basically started with what you guys have, which was nothing. And so um, I'm going to be there for um, until spring. And then after that, I'm going to retire saying goodbye to linguistics. <laughs> so I just wanted to add that. And I also like the way um, Olga, you said that um, that spelling as a tool sounds very SCT, which sociocultural theory, and all it does is um, help you to learn the um, um, structure of the language. So thank you for this presentation. I'm enjoying it. It's supposed to be on another um, Zoom meeting right now, but the heck with them. Thank you. And I will say that I took Hishin Lai's class in 2003, and she totally knew what she was doing by then. So <laughs> it didn't take her very long to learn if she didn't know anything, which I doubt. <laughs> anyway, she's an amazing teacher. But yes, um, one of the... Oh, there's tons more things in the chat. Um, but one of the things that is really important is also looking at, indeed, there's tons of stuff available on how people like humans learn language. And it's, yes, the situation of indigenous languages is different because of the colonization history and because of all the trauma, but there is still lots of lessons we can learn from how other languages are taught because people have been teaching each other languages for thousands of years, right? So we can we can totally learn from that as well. Um, I think our time is up. Yeah, and we so. have so many, so many things. As I say, keep looking at the chat. Um, and I forgot we had we had, had the idea of recording this and then I think we totally forgot about it. Uh, no, we are recording it. Oh, wow. ah, wonderful. Sure. Excellent, um, so sure. we are recording it. And that means that we'll be, I don't know what we'll do, but that means that we'll be able to hang on to the chat and all the wonderful resources that people shared there. And we can also make the video available afterwards and then we can listen to this again i think we've had lots of wonderful conversation here um so yeah thank you all so much for coming it was absolutely amazing to see you all i'm glad to have met Bruce, and I think I've never met Travis either, although we've been Facebook friends for at least 10 years. Um, so, yeah, thank you all so much. And maybe somebody else wants to do a closing word of some kind. Polly, I'm calling on you. Hi, I, I just wanted to say thank you very much, Olga Tanicho, and also for all those who are interested in, in our language workers among us. Uh, we're here to bring back our way of thinking. Our language is really important for how we view the world, our worldview. And so it's actually language has chosen us to be workers. We didn't ask uh, because I'm a, I'm a professor at a university, but I also um, work as a language worker. And for those of you, I have taught um, introduction. And so I heard you, Tanisha. And so for the for April, I can I can offer a, a, a virtual lunch and a Zoom lunch where we can learn introduction or we can practice together because it's, um, it's actually very, it, practicing together makes it really fun. And so um, I will I will start by um, asking who can meet and what day in, in April because I can offer it and um, and so this is what we do we work for our language because our language wants to live so and thank you and we do appreciate all the linguists who are there helping us and um, helping us on our journey back to 
um, back to learning to speak our language and to read and write our language. Thank you. All right, it was wonderful seeing you all. And if I can help with something, please don't be shy to be in touch. I'm on Facebook. I read my message messages. I have an email address. I read my email. So please, I do try and help. I really try. Okay, it was wonderful seeing you all. And I hope to see you all in person at some point soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks everybody for being here. Thank you for everything.